ليلة القدر وما أدرك ما ليلة القدر ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أهل سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر صدق الله العظيم العظيم السلام عليكم دعاء فائته اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم إني أفتتح الثناء بحمدك وأنت مسدد للشباب بمنك وأيضا سؤالك أنت أرحم الراحمين في موضع الأرض والرحمة وأشد الراقبين في موضع النفر والنفر وأعظم المتجبرين في موضع الكبرياء موسوعة <تصفيق> الحمد لله الذي لا مضاد له في ملكه ولا مراد له في أمره الحمد لله الذي لا شريك له في خلقه ولا شريك له في أرمته الحمد لله الفاشي في الخلق أمره وحمده الله رب الكرم مجنو الباسط بالجود يدا الذي لا تنقص خزائنه ولا تزيد كثرة العطاء إلا جودا وكرما إنه هو العزيز الوهاب اللهم إني أسألك قليلا كثير مع حاجة بي إليه عظيما وغراك عنه قديم وهو عندي كثير وهو عليك سن يسير اللهم إن عفوك عن ذنبي وتجاوزك عن خطيئتي وصبرك عن ظلمي وسترك على قبيه عملي وحلمك عن كثير جمي عندما كان من خطي وعندي أطعاني في أن أسألك ما لا أستوجبه منك الذي رزقتني برحمتك وأريتني من قدرتك وعرفتني من إجابتك فصرت عدوك عاملا وأسألك مستانسا رأيك وأنا وجل مدلا عليك فيما قسمت فيه ولا الذي يبغى عني هو خير لي لأنك بأقبة الأمور فلم أرى أمرا كريما أصبع على عبد ليما بك علي يا رب يا رب إنك تدوني فهو إياك وتتحبب إلي فأتبغض إليك وتتوتك إلي فلا أقبل منك كأنها لي أن تطول عليك 
فلم يمنعك ذلك من الرحمة لي والإحسان إلي والتفضل إلي بجودك وكرمك فارحم عبدك الجامل واجعل عليه بفضل إحسانك إنك جواب كريم الحمد لله مالك الملك مجري الفلك مسخر يا فارغ الاسباب ديان الدين رب العالمين الحمد لله على علمه بعد علمه والحمد لله على علمه بعد قدرته والحمد لله على طول حناته في قدره وهو قادر على ما يريد الحمد لله خالق الخلق باسط الرزق فارغ الاصباح ذي الجلال والاكرام والفضل والانعام الاديب وفلا يرام وقرب فشهد المجموع تبارك وتعالى الحمد لله الذي ليس له مناص اياد ولا شبيب يشاكره ولا ضمير يرفضه قهر بعزتك الاعزاء وتواضع لعظمة المظلاء فبلغ بقدرته ما يشاء الحمد لله الذي يجيب لي هين قرابي فيسر علي كل عورة وانا اعصي ويعظم النعمة علي فلا اجازي فكم من موجبة غنية قد اعطاني وعظيمة مخوفة قد كفاني وبهجة مونقة قد هواني فاثني علي الخامدة وانه مسببا الحمد لله الذي لا يهتك مجابه ولا يظلم بابه ولا يرد صاحبه ولا يخيب عامله الحمد لله الذي يؤمن الخائفين ويرجى الصالحين ويرفع المستضعفين ويرى المستكبرين ويهلك مملوكا ويستخلف الاخرين والحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبين الظالمين مدرك العارفين نكال الظالمين شريخ المستسرخين موضع خاجات الظالمين معتمد المؤمنين الحمد لله الذي من خشيته تغرى السماء وسكانه وترجف الارض وامارها ومن يسبح في غمراتنا الحمد لله الذي هدانا لقانا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي يخلق ولم يخلق ويعزق ولا يعزق ويعلم ولا يفهم ويريد الاغنياء ويؤتي الموتى وهو حي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على عبدك ورسولك وامين اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وامينك وسفيك وحبيبك وخيرتك من خلقك وحافظ سرك ومبلغ رسالاتك افضل واحسن واجهل وازكى ما وأطيب وأكمل وأسرى وأكثر ما صفيت وباركت وترحمت وتحننت وسلمت على أحد من عبادك وأنبيائك ورسولك وأهلك أمير المؤمنين ومسجد رسول رب العالمين عليك الأخير وأوجدك على قلبك وآيتك الكبرى والنبى العظيم صلى على السفينة الطاهرة فاطمة سيدة نساء العالمين وصلى على السفر الرحمة سيد الشباب اهل الجنه 
الحمد لله على منة الولاية وكفى بها منا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وعظيمنا وخبيب قلوبنا النبي المؤيد ورسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد والمحمود الأحمد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحبه المنتجبين ومن سار على هديهم وتمسك بهم إلى قيام يوم الدين ثم أما بعد Respected sisters and brothers, elders, distinguished guests, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allow me first and foremost to take this opportunity to thank in particular Brother Hassan for availing me of the opportunity to be with you again for the second year in a row. And hopefully according to Brother Rajwai, if I come for the third time, I better buy myself a Pakistani flag so I can become the official mascot for your tourism industry. Something that I'm very, very, very adamant to re-establish in this part of the world. Because I love your countryside and I think it is wasted and we have to do something about it. Uh, anyway, allow me again also, my respected sisters and brothers and distinguished guests, right from the beginning, to share with you a thought <clears throat> that we can all keep in mind for over the next 10 nights that we are having together so that this thought or this idea can become our quest for the rest of our life. The thought is as follows. In these blessed nights, the night of Laylatul Qadr, we ought to open our hearts to our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we can remove all the hatred from our hearts and that we plant instead in it the love to all people because there is nothing that can attract a person to another person more than the concept of having love towards him if the person you disagree with in opinion knew that your heart pumps with love towards him or her he will be attracted to you. Hostility does not make a person closer to the other because hostility creates a barrier between you and the rest of the people. Let us therefore learn, my dear loved ones, how to love and let us refrain from learning how to hate. We learn from our beloved Prophet وسلم, that his heart was always a soft heart. He never held grudges and his tongue was never harsh. He would, hear, he would hear his insults and accusations and he would face all these accusations and insults by saying the following, O oh Allah, forgive my people because they do not know. Do not torment them, O oh Allah. Give them an opportunity. Perhaps in this night they will be guided. This is how the Prophet approached people and this is how the Prophet approached his message in the way or in his quest to reach out to people. A true Muslim therefore, which is the subject matter of our lectures, being as a way of life not only as rituals. I think the myth of religiousness has been hijacked over a period of 1400 years ago to mean a set of rituals and nothing but a set of rituals which is far off from what the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt anticipated in the way they wanted to preach the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As you know, the central chord of the message of, the, of Allah in the Quran, the central theme of the message of Allah in the Quran is what? Is humanity. That's the, thin, the central theme in the Quran. Allah says, Inni fil ardi khalifa. I want to create a vicegerent. What is, the, what is that vicegerent? What is he made of? What does he represent? What does he stand for? What is he made of? And what is his task and mission? 
in carrying out that message to the rest of the creation that he lives amongst? Is it one where he is always attended or always in the attention of being enclosed within himself where he promotes his individualism at the cost of the rest of the community through the actions of what we call rituals when he neglects or she neglects to include within him or her the rest of the community around him that is not a vicegerent a person who holds such views is someone who becomes very much self-centered and egoistic within himself that he does not see any room to include others within himself and that what makes him an exclusive human being and not an inclusive human being. we want to be inclusive where we can have the right and the ability to encompass even those who do not see eye to eye with us even those who may disagree with us even those who may even go to the extent of wanting to kill us for that matter we need to reach out to them because the prophet said they don't know any better and if you know any better then you should be the one that reaches out to them first and not sit in your ivory towers throwing rocks at others and then expect them to reach out to you that will never happen brothers and sisters the onus is on us to always reach out to others this is the theme of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants therefore a true human being and when I say a true human being I'm always using that to represent a Muslim because if I ask and I think I said that last year when I was with you here if I ask what is a synonym to a Muslim I don't want any answer other than human that is a synonym for a Muslim. A synonym for a Muslim is not a submitter. A synonym for a Muslim is not the one that believes in a set of rituals. Yes, it is part and parcel of our faith. But a synonym to a Muslim is one who is a human, who encompasses in all of his existence all the principles and virtues of goodness from which he can make himself readily available to encompass others in all walks of his life in his way of interaction in his way of dealings in his way of speaking whether verbal or non-verbal in any part of his existence he becomes a true incarnation of what Allah wants him to be as a proper human therefore a true Muslim is the one that masters his manners, masters his etiquettes, masters his stance, masters his dealings, and masters his behavior. Where his main concern should be to preach the message of Allah and shoulder the trust of his faith with absolute truthfulness and not to please men, no backwardness, but to present Islam in a scientific, civilized, and mature way to the whole and to the entire human race. The Prophet وسلم, had this to say in regard to those who will come after him and want to reform what has gone wrong in the way this faith has been preached. And as you see around you, Islam unfortunately has been hijacked by certain groups here and there that do not reflect the essence of that faith. And we have become victims of this hijack. We have become the very victim of this particular hijack. The Prophet وسلم, said, the religion of Allah shall be carried out and protected in every age and era by just and truthful ones who shall nullify from it, yani from the myth that people include or the people that invent within that faith that shall protect in every age and era by just and truthful ones who shall nullify from it the interpretation of the wrongdoers and the fabrication of extremists and the impersonations of the ignorant 
just as bellows eliminate impurities from iron. It is our duties, brothers and sisters, when we see something going wrong in our faith, to stand firm and say, this is not Islam. This is baby culture. This is maybe my understanding. This is maybe what I have been taught through a sequence of certain traditions that have passed from one generation to another that did not depend on the true essence of what the Quran preaches and what the Quran wants. And that's why people will find so much objection later on in life with the advent of the coming of the righteous guide that we know to be Al-Mahdi Allah Ta'ala Farajan People will be astonished as to the way he preaches Islam to such an extent that people will say this is not the action of the children of Father. Why? Because he comes with strange ideas that people cannot comprehend. As the Prophet himself came with strange ideas that the Meccans could not comprehend. بدأ الإسلام غريبا وسيعود غريبا فطوبى للغرباء الذين يصلحون ما أفسد الناس من بعد. A statement by the Prophet who says that Islam began in its quest in Mecca as a strange phenomenon. In what way as a strange phenomenon? In the sense that what the Prophet preached was not familiar to the Arabs. The Prophet said women's a woman had rights. The Arab said, excuse me, what are you talking about? This is not part and parcel of our setup. This is not part and parcel of our fiber. This is not part and parcel of our education system. So it is a strange phenomenon that the Prophet comes to introduce in that particular world. The same happens because unfortunately our Islam to a great extent has been a masculine Islam does not have its feminine touch within it. And I know some men don't like me to say these things. Right? And I know people will come and challenge me on what I'm going to say. Fine! Let's challenge one another, but within the spirit of my opening statement. That I may disagree with you, and you may disagree with me, but let me reach out to you, and let you reach out to me on the basis of our discussion, from the basis of love and understanding not from the basis of grudges and hatred, right? I may not agree with you, and this is your right, and, I, and you may not agree with me, and this is also your right. So we have reciprocal rights not to agree with one another, but we do not have reciprocal rights to eliminate and erase one another. And that is what we are facing today, brothers and sisters. I disagree with you, I'm going to eliminate you. I disagree with you, I'm going to erase you. I disagree with you. I want to hunt you down. While the Prophet وسلم, was taught by Allah, You have no control or authority over them. All you need to do is preach to them. Preach. Let them make their own decision. Let them arrive at the conclusion that they find appropriate to their own well-being after looking and hoping into what constitutes the truth. Because your mission is to present the truth. But you need to present the truth in a way that appeals to the intellect of that human being. You do not preach the truth on the basis of your own perceived ideas of what may constitute the truth. Because what may constitute the truth is not necessarily the truth itself. What constitutes the truth is to identify the truth first. Like Ali ibn Abi Talib said in one of his statements, he said, it is not befitting for us to follow those who claim to be truthful, but it is only befitting to find the truth first and identify it, then we will be in a position to know who are the true followers of the truth? Why, brothers and sisters? Because someone who claims to be a follower of a truth may sleep. And if you have identified the truth through that person who slept, your entire system of belief in that truth will become shaky. But if you
you identify the truth in itself. Those who are following and slip along the way will not in any way shake your belief system in the truth. Because you've already established the basis of the truth that you follow. Regardless of who slips, or regardless who adds, or regardless who subtracts, or regardless who invents, or regardless of those who innovate. And how many innovations have we introduced in our faith only to think later that it is part and parcel of the truth that we claim as, you know, defect human beings sometimes that it represents the truth. We therefore, brothers and sisters, as the adherents of a multiversal intellectual system, here I need to make a small correction to the world universe for those who pride themselves in negating the existence of a God. We say we live in a universe to indicate the multitude of the cosmos that we live in. But the word uni signifies one. It does not signify a multitude of cosmos, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Rabbul Alameen, not Rabbul Alam. He is the Lord of a multi-cosmos system, not the Lord of a universe. The Lord of the universe is something else, our own imagination, our own contemplation, our own perception. There is not one verse in this world. There is a multitude of, of verses or multitude of cosmoses. So I have to twist the term for it to be from or to be changed from a universe to a multiversal intellectual system. We therefore, as the adherents of a multiversal intellectual system, must never live to make decisions on the spur of the moment, brothers and sisters. Rather, we must live to measure such decisions by the scales of the past, the present, and the future. In another word, a Muslim or a human being is someone who is always aware of his surroundings. There is a statement by one of our Imams, namely Imam al-Baqir or Imam Ali even, who sometimes Imam al all of them, they speak about the same concept. He says what? The most learned of the people of their time are the ones who are aware of their time. So you want to be aware of who you are and where you are, you must be aware of the time you live in. You cannot cocoon yourself in a particular secluded place, library, seminary, university, or society, which is absolutely disassociated and detached from the rest of the world, and then theorize for people how to follow and how to believe. No. You must become an active part and parcel individual of the place and the world you live in. You must be in touch with all the advancement of science and all the advancement of technology so that you could know what you are talking about and what is being talked about in front of you. Just like when someone was asked, Yani, one of those turban wearers like us, huh? he was asked, do you know that there is a flood in Timbuktu? How could there be a flood in Timbuktu? It's in the middle of a dry place. He said, where is this? On Mars? No, it's on Earth, Habib. It's on Earth. If you don't even know part of your world, how can you stand and preach about what the truth is going to be. And this is not an attack on any segment on our, in our society. I'm not here to attack. Wallah, I'm not here to attack. These servant wearers also, on the other hand, were able to actually have a dialogue with Anashtar, such as Allama Brujurdi, for example, who was discussing the theory of relativity with Einstein directly. 
through an exchange of letters that took place between Allama Projurdi in the early 20s, you know, and uh, Einstein of his time. And Einstein makes a remark to Allama Projurdi. I am paraphrasing now. Of course, he didn't say that. I'm saying that because I'm paraphrasing. He literally, it is as if Einstein was telling Allah Mabrujit, where the hell did you learn this? How did you get access to this knowledge? You are someone who is in the confinement of your own seminary. How were you able to probe science to such a deep level that you are talking to me about the theory of relativity? You know? This is to show you that the religion will abide by is different to the religion of the elite. It's different to the religion of the intellect. It's different to those who limit their religiousness to superficial religiousness, to outward religiousness, without the deep, concentrated, cemented idea of what constitutes religiousness. In a very quick example, a student of mine comes to me for once and he says, Shaykhuna, Shaykhuna means our Shaykh in Arabic. What makes a religious person a religious person? I said, you tell me. He says, someone who prays in the front row. I said, good. Next. He said, someone that holds a tasbih. Next. He said, someone that keeps his rosa. Good. Next. Someone that pays zakat, good, next. Someone that keeps homes, good, next. He said, thus, there's nothing more to it. I said, good. Let's take your concept of religiousness now outside the mosque. Because what you said so far is inside the mosque, right? For it, a reflection of what is being taught inside the mosque. Let's take that religiousness outside the mosque. The one who pays zakat, the one who pays clubs, the one that prays in the front line, and the one who holds a tasbih, the minute he steps out at the mosque, he tells lies. Is he still religious in your idea? The one that does all this, the minute he steps out the mosque, he hurts his neighbor. Does he still qualify to be religious? The same person steps outside and cracks at the opposite gender. Uh, and encroach on their privacy. Does that still constitute to you a religious person? He said, no. He said, no. I said, then what constitutes a religious person? I said, cricketers gives you the definition of what constitutes a religious person. And thank God you are a nation of cricket. He has to be an all-rounder. An all-rounder. A batsman, a bowler, a fieldsman, all of the things have to be encapsulated in that individual. So he becomes an incarnation of virtues and etiquette regardless of the space and the time he is in. Regardless of the given situation he finds himself in, whether it's a business transaction or a family transaction, whether it is a college transaction or a societal transaction, Whatever the transaction or the dealing it is, he finds himself always an all-rounder. He does not compromise. He does not sell. He does not give up. He keeps and maintains his principles regardless of the situation he finds himself in. Why? Because he holds a mission and a message. That mission and a message is not superficial. It is his own existence. It is a reflection of his entire existence on the face of this earth. And that's what singles him out or singles her out from the rest of the society that she lives in or that he lives in. To such an extent that when people cast a gaze at he or she, immediately he or she is easily identified on the basis of his principles and virtue system that he follows or that she follows. It is singled out. You become literally the odd one in society, but the odd on a positive term, not on a, in a negative term. You become odd, not by wearing your mohawk. No, 
I know those students who studied abroad know what a more is. Huh? You become odd, not on the basis of the way you dress with local jeans. Sorry to say that, to such an extent that people could identify the mark of your, let me not go there. Okay? Why would I need to know what sort of Calvin Klein you're wearing under your jeans? Uh, that's not my concern. Huh? That's not modernism. That's not being part and parcel of being progressive. That is, if it indicates anything, it indicates the flow of following without being a pioneer of leadership. Or a pioneer in leadership. Instead of me following, I become an icon of leadership. That people follow instead of me allowing myself to be a follower. But that cannot be maintained or established or achieved unless or until we are able to live inwardly and outwardly that system which is multiversal intellectual system that Allah wanted us to follow. Therefore, a Muslim is someone that calculates all his decisions or her decisions in light of both worlds, this life and the hereafter, <coughs> i.e. he or she is a balanced human being in the way they think, in the way they feel, in the way they interact, in the way, in the way they react, and in their verbal and non-verbal communication skills. And that what leads him or her to a balanced lifestyle wherever they find themselves living. Imam Ali Alayhi says about a human being, which we've already established that this human being is himself a Muslim. He says, your medicine is surely embedded within you, yet you are oblivious to it. And then he says, and your cure is from your own self, yet you are unaware. You falsely claim that you are a minor or a small mass, yet within you, the world at large has its secret hidden and embedded within you. Everything is within you, but you have to look introspectively. Look within you, man arafa nafsa. The one that identifies himself, identifies himself on what basis? Identifies his potential. Identify all the hidden secrets of capabilities that Allah has embedded in you to explore the world at large. And then you extrapolate, i.e. you bring out, you extrapolate all these hidden treasures and potentials in order to do what with them? In order to serve others with them, not only to be self-centered and serve yourself with it. That's why when I was in a community once in Dubai, not far away from here, one hour and 40 minutes by plane. And by swimming, I don't know, maybe three days if you can reach me. It says what? I was in a community preaching. I said, we speak about being a cohesive community. Cohesiveness indicates what? Cooperation. Sharing. Because sharing is what? It's scary, right? These concepts are not familiar to us in this modern world. What you, in the world we live in. Sharing is scaring is a myth that, that now is outdated by self-centeredness, by the ego-centered concept that our children are being taught in colleges as what? As individualism. You are an individual in your own right. No one should have an authority over you, not even God himself. That's what we've been taught. Huh? Not even God can tell you what to do. Isn't that what Simpson tells us? Simpson says even God should not have an authority on you. Huh? Those who watch Simpsons, there was a particular program about Simpsons where Homer Simpson, his highness, you know, comes to defy the very concept of the existence of, let's see, someone that controls the universe or the multiverse, right? I said, what is your views after making your first million dollars? It's good. Who is
is not ambitious enough to make a million dollars in his business. Everyone wants that. I said, what is your next step after you make the first million? By God, all the people in the Imam Bar, without fail, the religious and the non-religious among them, they said to make the next million. I said, MashaAllah. So how about if we change the paradigm? They said, don't change this paradigm, it won't work. I said, no, but let me probe into your mind a little bit. Based on the system that you believe in, or based on the system that, sorry to say that, that you claim you believe in, okay? When you make your first million, you should think about how your brother can make his first million. That is cohesion. That is what we call sharing is caring, right? But forget it, man. What the hell are you talking about? Who cares about the other guy whether he makes his first million or not? As long as I make my trillion, no one gives any care. I don't want to use big words. About anyone else in that society or community that we live in, right? As long as we are self-centered individuals. And that's why chaos is spreading in the world like wildfire. You know, we see so much problems in the world and you know, we sit and scratch our head and then we say, why is God so unjust? God is telling you to be, God is imposing this system on us. God is the one who's bringing Malaika down with EK-47s or AK-47s and saying, do not share with the other. God doesn't do that. God has given you a weapon of sharp attitude, which is called the intellect. That intellect can either be a sword that you can use against yourself, or a sword of balance, where you dispute, or you actually verify, and can create a rift between justice and injustice, oppression and equality, kindness, and helpfulness. This is all based on the internet. So if we see ourselves in a community or a society where the class system is beginning to grow further from one another, it is not the injustice of God, but it is the injustice of the human intent. That is at work. That we are not willing to share and close the gap between this class system. Like Imam Ali said, Wallah, law anna al fakra rajulan, laqa talta hu akalta. Imam Ali said, By God, if poverty was incarnated into a person, I would have called that person to combat and I would have finished it. If poverty was to be represented in one person, yani, in order to eliminate poverty, the Imam says, I would not hesitate to call that person to combat so I can finish it from the face of You know why? Because poverty leads to kufr. Poverty leads to disbelief. And the perpetrators of creating that gap are the ones who are actually encouraging that statement of disbelief to go further in the mind and heart of the But thank God we have a community that despite its poverty, their hearts still reach out to Allah and say, Inna Allah am asad. Surely Allah is with the patient ones. Surely Allah is with the patient ones. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Having said that, that the whole universe is in fact embedded within you, is in fact its secrets have been placed within you in order that we can extrapolate it and move and advance and launch our intellect into the horizon of thinking and thoughts and mindfulness in this world. We find that the famous poet from the Indian subcontinent, none other than your Muhammad Iqbal, who had this to say in regard to this issue. He says, surely non-belief is perplexed and the horizon of non-belief is a part of loss. These are his words. He says, non-belief is perplexion, yani doubtfulness, 
not knowing where to go or where to come from. That's non-belief. Regardless of the non-belief is in what? He is saying non-belief as a generic term, right? Non-belief is perplexion and the horizon of this non-belief is the path of loss. While true belief is a universe that the whole cosmos in it has become one single world. The whole cosmos in the belief system is so small in the horizon of what you believe on proper grounds. These are the words of Allah Akbar because he knew how to distinguish between what true belief constitutes and what false belief constitutes. This has become, brothers and sisters, an intrin intrinsic due to the following fact that even modern science of today has finally come to recognize and endorse that, pho pho that phenomenon that we cannot afford anymore to be oblivious to some sort of a belief that is based on practicality. Not on myth, not on ritual, not on any of these concepts that does not lead a human being to reach his full potential on the basis of his humanity. He's being restricted, confined to certain standards that others believe what makes your humanity. While in true essence, what makes your humanity is to liberate yourself from everything around you and everything that controls you and everything that subdue you and everything that makes you artificial so that you can go back to your pure self of being the true representative of truth on earth. The true representative of what God wants from you. Not that superficial being that sits or lives in this world for a number of years and then leaves this world not knowing where he came into and where he's going to. Right? Which leaves him so perplexed. And you will see that this perplexion ends up in disastrous consequences. Disastrous outcomes. And these are not my words. These are not my thoughts. My thoughts will come later. But these are the thoughts of modern psychologists. What do they have to say about this? Modern today psychologists have said that in this world we are living in, we find that there are a large number of people searching for meaning in a world that sometimes seems to some so meaningless. It doesn't have any meaning. Why am I here? What am I doing? Why there is so much carnage? Where is so much fighting? Why so much poverty? So much injustice? All those concepts that are prevalent in today's world that we live in. To such an extent that sometimes we as people tend to try and find happiness in the wrong places. For real happiness does not lie in dreams or fantasies or denials but rather true medicine to heal our problems and doubts is found within our own souls and our own selves. But we look for solutions and medicine outside. We look for happiness in a Prada bag. But okay, you bought it and then what? Huh? You got your Prada bag, which is the ultimate dream of some woman. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> or the Breitling watch. The official watch for Bentley. Have you got it and then what? Then what? Huh? You worked all your life for a Brighton or for a Versace. Yeah, for example. And then what? Huh? Is this your value? Not to others, but at least to yourself. And I'm not saying you cannot hold a Prada bag. No, hold it. But hold it and keep holding it and not allow it to hold you. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Keep holding it but do not allow it to hold you. Do not allow it to control you. Do not allow it to be the main purpose of your existence. That is the difference 
between being in control and being controlled. That is the true essence of liberation from a prophetic concept. When the Prophet says, say la ilaha illallah, it was not a statement that was meaningless. It was a statement that was so profound that the elite poets of the Arabs rejected it. Why? Because they knew their authority will be forfeited to something bigger than them. And they could not comprehend the fact that they should forfeit their authority to someone else. That is the essence of La Ilaha. Meaning, no authority, no guardianship, no leadership, no authority, save that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, the Meccans will not tolerate such a concept because of their ego. The ego that was so huge that used to shoot up to their heads that they could claim themselves they were the gods of the world. And they were in control of the lives of those that lived around them and lived with them or lived under their control, so to speak. Therefore, we cannot find true meaning to life in outside artificial influences, brothers and sisters. The same effect lies within the powerful resource of our own souls. That is why traditional meaningful values principles and the concept of real families no longer form the glue that bonds society together. In fact, in today's uncertain political and economic world, psychologists say more of us are feeling that something essential is missing in our lives. And one of the most renowned psychologists in contemporary USA by the name of Thomas More author of the best-selling book, Care of the Soul, says the great melody of our century is the loss of people's soul. That absence of soul from the existence of people have made them so notorious, so obnoxious, so beastly like because they prefer the superficial and the artificial to the essence of their existence. And Ali ibn Abi Talib says, live in this world as if you're going to live forever. And work for the hereafter as if you will depart tomorrow. Balance. Balance in your outlook in as far as your commitment and attachment to this world. And in as far as your commitment and attachment to your ahim, to your hereafter. To what awaits us all after that transition or transit state that we move on from one state to another. This particular psychologist goes on to say, when the soul is neglected, this is very important brothers and sisters because this is scientific. I'm not reciting now a hadith from the Prophet because sometimes people attach more importance to scientific evidence than to the hadith of the Prophet. But now we can see the link between the two. We can see that why people do not attach significance to the statements of the prophets and the imams. Because sometimes we speak to people nonsense. And then we say to them, the imam said and the prophet said. When the imam and the prophet did not say what we claim to say that they said. And that's why we find there's a huge gap between science and religiousness sometimes. Yet. The essence of the Qur'an is scientific. The essence of the Qur'an is intellectual. The essence of the Qur'an is divine. Allah in nearly every ayah of the Qur'an that appeals to the intellect, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? أَفَلَا يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Should they not think? Should not they ponder? Should they not reflect? These are terms that appeal to the intellect, brothers and sisters. They do not appeal to myth, do not appeal to fables, do not appeal to fairy tales. They appeal to the intellect and the mind of a sane human being that Allah says, when you want to approach me, approach me scientifically. Approach me intellectually. Don't approach me on the basis of myth. Don't approach me on the basis of hearsay. Don't approach me on the basis of fables. 
Don't approach me on the basis of telling me tales of Harry Potter, who God knows what, you know, and Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone. Don't appeal to me from that perspective. Appeal to me on the basis of your intellect, on the basis of your ability to decipher information that has been put in you and you've been given the key, which is the mind, to extrapolate it and bring it out from your system. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. So he goes further to say, when the soul is neglected, it does not simply go away. It doesn't just go away. Okay, I don't want to look after myself. I want to booze, or I want to drink, or I want to womanize, or I want to chill, so to speak. Because in our standard, chillaxing, which is chilling and relaxing, combined becomes chillaxing, means what? Means to have fun the wrong way. As if to say, Islam does not allow you to have fun the halal way. Huh? And you know what? What is halal and haram, brothers and sisters? What is halal and haram? If I may use the term hal haram to indicate harm, they seem to like Huh? Haram, haram. Then we will be better equipped to understand the concept of haram. Then we will have no issues. Then we will not come and say, oh, Mawlana, you all speak about haram. What are we doing? You know, come to the right Mawlana, they are so much fun. You know? Wallah, they are so much fun. No one can have fun like Mawlana, I trust you. <laughs> but you, you have to know how to, you know, yani reach them. Huh? You know, you need to know how to, and don't reach them through this, please. You'll corrupt them. I'm telling you, don't reach them through this. You'll corrupt them. Because Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in passing, I'm saying this. He said, if you see a scholar attending the palaces of the elite, do not take your religion from them anymore. Because they've been bought. They've been bought. Tomorrow they'll give you any fatwa. Tomorrow they'll give you any halal and haram issue. Because money talks. The glitter of Uncle Sam, when it's spread in front of our faces, it lights up. It lights up. So avoid that from them. Anyway, when the soul is neglected, it doesn't go away. It appears symptomatically. Yani it appears in other illnesses, symptomatically, symptoms, it appears in other symptoms. What are these symptoms? These are psychologists, professionals, are talking to us brothers and sisters and they are appealing to our intellect. Look what they say. They appear symptomatically in obsessions, addictions, violence and loss of meaning. And loss of meaning. You know, recently we lost a great singer. I don't listen to singers. But I'm speaking from the perspective of those who think that singers are great. You know that British singer, what's her name? Wine writer? Huh? You're not living with time? You don't know the singers of modern time? La ilaha illallah. What's her name? Amy Wine? Winehouse. I don't know. I'm speaking according to critics. In inverted commas. She was beautiful, okay? She fit all the Milan or Rome or Paris or New York catwalks in terms of her body size, okay? She fits all this. Beautiful, good physique, good money, good everything. But her soul was neglected. She killed herself. She took her own life. Does anyone stand and ask why? Why? I mean, if we think happiness is in that, then why are these people being expired? And being expired in the most horrific of ways. <laughs> Study the life of Michael Jacob, with all due respect to those that idolize him and love him. <laughs> yeah, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson is Michael Jackson. Right? Study the life of Amy. Study the life of uh, Monroe, study the life of all these top-notch multi-millionaires 
you know, to such an extent that they didn't know what to do with their money, they started changing colors. Huh? <laughs> they started changing their own colors. They don't know what to do with their money. Loss of meaning. Loss of essence. Loss of essence. Loss of essence. Loss of your existence in this world. And this is not, you know, some scholar saying this. I mean, some turban world saying this. No, this is a psychologist whose book is the best selling book in the USA. He's saying that negligence of the soul does not simply go away when the soul is neglected. It does not just go away, it appears symptomatically in obsession, addiction, and loss of meaning. Now, look what the Quran says in regard to the same concept, but in a very two-line explanation. Allah says, indeed, successful is he or she who innovates. Indeed, successful is he or she that elevates it. Elevates what? The soul. The soul. Like what this, our friend said, Thomas More. Thomas More is saying, if you elevate the soul, you will be saved. But if you neglect it, it will symptomatically come to haunt you in these issues. Addictions, obsession, <laughs> loss of meaning, and so on, and so forth, and crime, and what have you. And then the Quran says what? He who elevates it surely is successful. And who neglects it, neglects the soul, yani, does not look after it. Just like our friend was saying, when the soul is being neglected, it does not simply disappear. It does not just hide. It does not just take a holiday on the country. It comes back to haunt you in different ways and addictions and so on and so forth. That's exactly what the Quran says again. And he who neglects it will be at loss. Will be at loss. Your, your, your soul, due to the fact that it's being neglected, it just simply doesn't go away. It comes to haunt you back in different addictions. Allah said, indeed successful is he or she who elevates it and doomed is he or she that neglects it. That neglects it. Like, does science stop there? No, it continues. And I don't know how long we time, by the way. Uh, I'm, I'm done? Way done, right? And I don't give me a mic. Because I don't know how to leave it. Right? All right, I will just throw one little light on that. Uh, seriously, do you believe we've been here for 45 minutes now? No, come then. That's my point. According to, according to two separate studies, conducted at Duke University Center for Religion, Spirituality and Health. Each involving, yani each study involved for those who are doubtful or spectacle. Not one or two. 4,000 participants. In every study, they hired 4,000 participants to do what? And they found out the following. Those who consider themselves to lead a spiritual life tend to have, number one, listen to this, this is science, lower blood pressure. So what, have, what has religiousness got to do with blood pressure? Huh? Sometimes you think, what has being spiritual got to do with my blood pressure? Huh? Okay. Second, half as likely to suffer from depression as to those who are not in attendance to their soul, who don't attend to their soul. Why? In fact, more than 250 studies at Yale, Dartmouth and other universities have found that people with all sorts of spiritual belief benefit from the following a stronger immune system, making them less prone to catch colds and develop other illnesses. Not only that, it goes on to say, and lower rates of heart disease, emphysemia, diabetes, cancer, and suicidal inclination. Greater mental and physical ability to deal with illness and recover faster. How is that so 
if I become more spiritual, that I will be able to save myself from all these symptoms. Scientific! I'm giving you science. I'm not going to give you Quran today. Look what science says. It says, and I will stop here. And I will ask doctors to either endorse what I'm saying or falsify what I'm saying. Because it's easy these days to falsify information. Go to Uncle Google or Hajj Wikipedia. You will get every answer you want, right? During these are the, the, the words of cardiologists and top-notch doctors. They say, during a stressful situation, what happens? Why do we get stressed? This is what happens when you get stressed. Don't get stressed. This world is not worth it. Especially don't get stressed over your husband. Alright? It's not worth it. Alright? Just especially, for the especially the husbands of today. And during stressful situations, sorry, Hazar. <laughs> during stressful situations, the adrenal glands flood the body with chemicals that raise heart rate and blood pressure. What lowers them? Okay, now I have a stressful situation. My heart rate is what? My chemicals are rising. My blood pressure is shooting up. These studies say, how do we lower it? How do we bring it down? We give you tablets? We don't want to give you tablets. There is another way of reducing it. These doctors say, pray. Meditating and reading uplifting spiritual literature appeared in these studies to lower these chemical levels and prevent stress from harming the body any further. Look what Allah says, I will finish Allah. Officially, I will finish. Allah says, Verily, the remembrance of Allah soothes the heart and fills it with tranquility and peace. Assalamu alaikum. Until we meet tomorrow, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who when they listen to anything they will follow what is. Before I leave, today is the day of the shahada of Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. It is only courteous that we remember Ali ibn Abi Talib in regard to what happened to you. Small two minute majlis of your time. Ali ibn Abi Talib وسلم, we know he was struck on the night on the, on the 19th on the 19th of Rabat look at this great man how he communicates his humanity with his killer this is religiousness brothers and sisters this is religiousness and not just mundane acts of rituals Ali ibn Abi Talib comes to his morning prayer gets struck by Abdul Rahman ibn Mulja, splits his head open to such an extent, and I don't want to be boring, that the whiteness of his brain shows from the severity of the strike that this man puts on the head of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib is brought back to consciousness the poison has already gone through his body, but he is still in control. Imam Hassan is standing right next to the captive, yani the perpetrator of the crime, Abdul Rahman ibn Muljah. The shackles, the chain on the hands of Abdul Rahman ibn Muljah were very tight. <coughs> Ali ibn Abi Talib makes a remark for oh, Hassan. Loosen the shackles on the hand of my killer. You know, the Muslims look at him and say, are you for real? Are you for real? You are saying to us to loosen the chains of the very hands that caused what we say, Based on your killing, the pillars of guidance have come down. Oh, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Based on your killing, the pillars of guidance have been brought down because you were the representation of the pillars of guidance. You say to us to loosen his chains, he said not on the yacht. You loosen his chain and you feed him from the same milk you have been feeding. For I heard my beloved Prophet Muhammad 
saying, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْمُسْلَى وَلَوْ بِالْكَلْبِ الْعَقُونَ He said, he do not, on account of my killing, mutilate the body of my killer. For I heard my beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, do not mutilate anyone, even if it was a poisonous dog. Even if it was a harmful dog, don't mutilate it, but honor its existence in this world. And this is a killer, brothers and sisters, the killer that we make laan on day and night. Right? Yet Abi Talib, when he deals with his killers, he deals at a different level of humanity, at a different level of understanding. And then Ali ibn Abi Talib drops the final bombshell. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. When he says, and leave him to me, for if I leave, I know how to deal with him. All the scholars of Islam, brothers and sisters, our Sunni respected scholars, our Shia scholars, our Zaydi scholars, our all the scholars of Islam, when they studied the statement of Ali ibn Abi Talib, upon which he said, if I was to leave, I will deal with him personally. They all unanimously said that Ali ibn Abi Talib was going to forgive Abdul Rahman ibn Bunjah. That he was going to release him from captivity. Why? Because Allah says, treat unto others in the way you have been treated. But if you forgive, it is more worthy in the eyes of Allah. It is more worthy in the eyes of Allah. Ali ibn Abi Talib comes out from the house of his daughter Zainab. The Riwayah says, Um Kulthum, brothers and sisters, Zainab and Um Kulthum are one person. Are one person. He comes out, and when he takes hold of the door, his chain around, or his belt around his waist comes under. Look what he says. It is as if the door does not want to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because it is, or as if the door had a feeling that it was the last night of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then he remarks, Ushtut hayazi makal al maut, fa inna al maut la ika. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, Tighten your belt and face death. Surely death will be meeting you regardless. Regardless whether the door obstructs you or anything obstructs you, the death will come to you. He leaves, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. The ducks and the swans in the house of Zainab follow Ali ibn Abi Talib. And then someone tries to hold them. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, let them, let them follow their imam. Let them follow their imam. They are creatures like you. They have feelings. They know that I'm going to a boat which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam had promised me. And he said, oh Ali, the time you will be struck, this will be died with the color of this. Meaning, your blood will pour to your beard and it will change the color of your beard on account of the color of your blood. Salawatullah alayka ya Ali ibn Abi Talib, the one who said, I shall never foster compromise on the basis of weakening my faith. Assalamu ala Ali in yawma wulit, wa salamu ala Ali in yawma stushhid, wa salamu ala Ali in yawma yub'at hayya, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Muhammadin wa alihi tayyibin al-tahirin, wa salamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Please, for the departed soul of our loved one, for the departed soul of the ones who have established this majlis, for the departed soul of our brothers and sisters who are in gathering today, and anyone who is not with us today, let us bestow on them and bequeath them Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha, proceeded with Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.